Hello and welcome back to the Gay ZZ channel. I'm Rob and I hope you're having a wonderful day today. Today, we're jumping into some tales from tech support. Our first story today comes to us from Isaac Dombastine. This is why you always disconnect your tech gear before lightning strikes. Let's jump right in. Hi all, long time lurker, first time poster. I don't work in tech support, but I am my family's go-to tech support guy, so I have a few stories to tell. So back in January, I installed a Google Mesh system in my parents' home, so they could have better network coverage in their house, as the ISP-provided router wasn't powerful enough to cover the entire house. The Mesh system is of the second-gen Google Wi-Fi system, not the newer Nest Wi-Fi stuff. Now, if you don't know how a Mesh network is set up, you have one main router, master, and several access points, which kind of act like the slaves. They all wirelessly connect to each other and provide a stable and reliable connection around the house you set the points up in, as long as you set them up within reasonable range. In our case, we had the master in my dad's office directly connected to the ISP router, and two slaves placed in the hallway and in the living room. This system worked perfect and was pretty reliable, up until this story. One morning, I wake up to something like seven or eight missed calls from my mom. Apparently that morning, there had been a few powerful lightning strikes in the area where they live, and the power was all out for a while until my dad hooked up the power generator in the house. However, when they got everything back up and running, they noticed there was no network in the house at all. So I started going through all the usual troubleshooting steps I could, before I had to go to work, which wasn't really that much. Check everything's connected properly both on the main router and the mesh system. Check if my dad has a wired connection to his desktop. Check our file server for network connection. And finally, reboot absolutely everything. Router, mesh, everything that has to do with the network. Once it all was back up and running again, still nothing. So I started thinking the main line into the entire village that provides the ADSL network for the village could be shot or maybe a base station. So I checked the ISP status page for any eventual line disconnects or errors, which I found none. So I told my parents to just live off the cellular connection as much as possible for the day before I headed to work, then we'd look more into it when I got back home. Later that day, I got a call from my mom and was told that apparently some techs that work for a contractor company our ISP uses just out of nowhere contacted my dad and told him they would come up to their house and replace their main modem as they had apparently seen some irregularities. How the heck they were able to see that, I have no idea. But I had figured earlier that day that the modem probably was shot since I never saw any errors on the ISP status page. So, my dad somehow managed to set up the ISP router himself with the correct settings and the main network went back up, however, it wasn't really working as it should. So, as I said, I installed a Google Mesh system in their house so they would have proper connection all around the house. However, from that morning, the Mesh network didn't work at all. They asked me a few times throughout the week what the issue could be, but the little troubleshooting I was able to do earlier in the week never really told me anything. We checked connections, rebooted, nothing worked. For information, I live five hours away from my parents by car, and I don't have a car. So it wasn't really an option to get to their house and do the troubleshooting myself. So this all had to be done over the phone, which is hard enough when you work with IT competent people, but even harder when you talk with someone who doesn't really know much more than the basics to operate their computer and smartphone on a day-to-day -day basis. So this morning we went haywire on getting the mesh network back up and running, as well as figuring out what in the F actually brought it down in the first place. The first thing we did was the usual textbook stuff, reboot, check connections, all that simple stuff. After all that was done and we still were stuck with the same result, it hit me. Every router has some sort of status LED that lights up in all kinds of colors to indicate the status of the router. In the case of these Google Wi-Fi points, it's the following. White for everything's okay, blinking blue for both working and ready for setup, solid blue for factory reset and progress, blinking orange for no connection, blinking red for when something's wrong with the router. This hit me way too late, so out of nowhere, I pulled up the Google support page that shows what the colors mean before I asked my dad 
What color is the front LED on the router? To my unexpected surprise, I get back. Um, it's blinking orange. At this point, I just smashed my head in the desk and immediately had an idea of what the issue could be. So I immediately told my dad to go downstairs and grab one of the two mesh points I had put there and bring it upstairs. After five minutes, we had a new point upstairs in my dad's office connected and powering on. Wouldn't you guess it, it got a connection right away. It was also 10 times quicker at starting up. This immediately confirmed my suspicion. What had happened was the lightning that fried our main router also managed to fry parts of the motherboard in the Google Wi-Fi point that was directly connected to the router with a cable. Therefore, the Ethernet in port was fried and the router didn't receive any network signal in. So what we had to do was reset the entire mesh network, set up one of the other routers as the master router and the two others as slaves again in the same positions and voila, it all was up and running again. Now, even though we got it all back up and running, I have set up a warranty case with Google to see if we can get this replaced. But until then, the partially dead point serves as the hallway mesh point. So moral of the story, if you know there's going to be any sort of lightning in your area, please make sure to disconnect any network equipment that is critical and could be killed easily if lightning strikes. This whole story seems like a big ol' advertisement for surge protectors and UPS systems. I mean, they're both made to protect against this, so if these items had been on some kind of system like this, I don't think they would have had as much problem. However, I'm no electrician, I don't know how electricity works, and I'm sure you guys will let me know in the comments down below. Do me a quick favor, have a look down below the video. If that subscribe button's still red, it means you're not actually subscribed to the KCC channel. Please hit that subscribe button for more daily Reddit stories. Our next story today comes to us from Jackal Feed, and that's how you invalidate your service agreement. Let's jump right in. It's late on a Saturday and I'm trying to wind down into the last half hour of my shift when I get it. The call you don't want to get when you're trying to get out of the door. Call comes in and not only does the site not really know how to explain what they did clearly, ESL caller, they don't know why they did it. All I can really get out of them is that after a power outage, they can't run any cards. After some back and forth getting their service ID, verifying what equipment of ours is on their site, and what contracts we have with them, I start probing to see where it hurts. That's when I get the full story. The site came back up from the power outage, and their POS and commander server were back up and running, but they couldn't do any financial transactions. Do they call us? No. Do they submit an online support ticket? Nope. What did they do? They unplugged every ethernet cable out of the router, and jammed them back in at random without noting what was where and where they put them. I look out at the setting sun from the office window and realize it may be a while before I get home to eat dinner. First thing I do is shoot a message to one of my T3 specialists because part of our SOP is to run situations like this by them. The reply to my team's message is in verbatim, ha 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 and then my T3 sends me a snippet of the KB on things that invalidate your service contract with unguided attempts at self-repair highlighted. I let the site know that we won't be able to dispatch for this one and that they, in nicer words, effed up. They don't fight me, but I'm just talking to a cashier and they usually leave the snarling for their management. I do want to get this resolved, but I can't see what's plugged into where because I'm hundreds of miles from them and we can't connect to the site because the WAN 1 port has some other random ethernet cable jammed into it. So I call their managed network service provider to see if they can see, well, anything. I tell the router tech guy what happened and his immediate response is, <laughs> oh wow. We end up walking the site through tracing cables together and trying to get the router talking to their ISP so we can log in and see anything. But the site is just so clueless about anything to do with tech, and there are some blatant language issues that are making it harder. Router tech ends up escalating to the site's parent company, XYZ Petrol, to get them to dispatch an on-site tech, which they'll likely be fined for, and until that's resolved, we can't do anything for them. Because, Ethernet goes in any port, right? Anyways, 
the site learned a very expensive and painful lesson today and won't be able to do literally anything but cash transactions for maybe days. With that, I promptly fled the building before my luck got any worse. Thanks for reading. So let's get this straight. They know nothing about a system that basically runs their whole company and then they just decide, well, it's not working. Let's take it apart and put it back together without any experience at all. I sincerely hope whoever eventually went out there to fix this charged them a massive ID10 T tax. Our last story today comes to us from ASCII Forever. These processors are too good. Let's jump right in. Kind of long, apologies if it's too boring. Many years ago, I was a service tech for an automation company. We sold complete solutions including all hardware and software for large installation. Most of these were multiple branch situations connected via leased phone lines back when the internet wasn't a thing. One of the guys I worked for was from Russia and one of the smartest people I've ever worked with. His experience in computers involved having to rebuild most systems at a customer's site since the factory just shipped stuff out to make their quotas, no one cared if it worked. So he was an excellent troubleshooter down to the component level. He was our in-house tech support guru, let's call him Ivan. Some of the items we sold with our systems were computer terminals, which were manufactured by another vendor, and they frankly were not that great. My company was in the process of spinning up our own ability to manufacture a new line of terminals, but two large sales came up before we were ready, so our old vendor was tasked to build an intermediate model. Better than the old ones, not as good as our new and improved models would be. So they built around 150 to 200 units, half were installed for a customer in California, and half went to a customer in the eastern US. We started to get reports of erratic behavior from both customers. Basically, the display would get scrambled and the terminal had to be reset, soft reset, but it cleared any work in progress, so the customer had to re-enter what they were doing. We figured out that static electricity was a common cause, a user would walk across some carpet, touch the terminal, and the display would scramble. Sometimes it would happen without anyone touching it at all. We kicked this problem back to the vendor and sent some of the problem units to them. They also sent one of their QA techs to the customer's site to see if he could figure it out. We also sent a couple of units to our engineering group at our manufacturing center. So lots of people were working on the problem, but no one was working very hard. The vendor knew we would not be buying any more terminals from them, so they kind of went through the motions. Our engineering folks had many problems they were working on, and they knew that we would not have any more of this model coming online, so they were not too invested in the problem either. The customer was really unhappy with how long things were dragging on, months, and was complaining to the sales team, who was complaining to my boss, who was the service manager for the Western US. He called Ivan and me in and said he wanted us to solve the problem. Forget about everyone else who was working on it. Overtime was authorized for us to work after hours. Ivan knew way more about digital circuits than I did, but I was around as an assistant. That evening, we pulled one of the units apart so the logic board was exposed, but the unit was powered up. We found we could force the problem by simply touching the microprocessor chip with a metal tool or even a finger running it along the leads. We could not believe that an entire load of chips was defective, so Ivan was poking around and then got the idea that maybe the chip was getting dirty power. We had an oscilloscope handy and he checked for ripple on the power lead for the chip and it looked fine. However, Ivan realized the voltage looked wrong. It should be 5 volts. I couldn't tell from scale we were using, so we grab a DVM and check the voltage, and it's about 4.5 volts. Ivan grabbed a catalog we had and looked up the chip. It required 5 volts plus or minus 0.25 volts, so the power was out of spec, but the terminal still worked at 95% of the time. He started checking voltages where the supply connected to the logic board. It was around 4.95 volts. The power supply was in an external brick, which we opened up and found 5.05 volts. I think this was almost 40 years ago. The brick was connected to the terminal by a 6-foot multiple lead cable. I was thinking how terrible this was. I had no idea how we were going to fix it. I'm guessing the vendor is going to have to rebuild all the power supplies. Or we are. 
Ivan just held up a hand and continued reading the catalog and looking into the power supply. He then announces that the 5 volts is supplied by a specific regulator in the power supply, and the company makes a 6 volt regulator in an identical case, and we'll just swap it and see what happens. Next day we went to a local supplier and bought a couple of the 6 volt regulators, rushed it back to the office, and swapped out the 5 volt for a 6. The regulator was not even soldered in, it used a socket. We powered the terminal up and started checking voltages. We had at least 5 volts everywhere, and the terminal display was stable now. We had another terminal, so we did the same thing for it and found it was stable also. We wrote up our findings and sent them off to our engineering team. In the meantime, we bought enough 6 volt regulators to upgrade all our customers' units. We told our local tech to just start changing out the regulators on an as-needed basis and to put a colored sticky dot on each power supply he upgraded. Then, when we got a whole bunch of stuff from our engineering team, they had created a field change order complete with components, diagrams, forms, and wanted us to use this instead. We figured their fix would take over an hour per unit to upgrade, ours would take 5 minutes. They had included additional wiring to make the voltage adjustable on a unit by unit basis. Ivan and I talked it over with our boss and decided we'd just proceed with our easy fix and hope no one followed up with us. Ivan pointed out that the real problem was the chips were too good. If they had really required the specified voltage, the problem would have been discovered by the manufacturer and solved before the terminals left the factory. Of course, he was joking, but it was kind of true. Some weeks later, I was at a party where one of the engineers that worked for terminal manufacturer happened to be. He and I knew each other pretty well, and I knew he had been one of the team that designed the problem terminal. I was describing what we had found and how we had fixed it, and he kind of leaned back in his seat and rolled his eyes. I asked him what the problem was, and he told me that the original design called for the power supply to be internal to the terminal, so there would not be a 6 foot power lead. So maybe everything would have been okay if they hadn't switched to the external brick, which was done since they wanted to use a slimmer case for the terminal. At the end of the day, the customer was happy, the sales team was happy, and we were happy. And I got a lesson in perfect being the enemy of good enough. Ah yes, the classic company shipping things out to meet their quotas while not having any quality control. Hmm, we see that a lot. Hey, if you've made it this far in the video, do me a favor and go check out my buddy, The Austin Analysis. He's starting up doing some Reddit videos, he has a lot of personality in his readings, and I highly recommend him. Go on over there and give him a subscription, the link is at the top of the description down below. Check out all three OPs linked in the description down below. I thank you for watching, have a wonderful day, and we'll see you tomorrow.